All right, guys, so let's continue on with the Declaration of Independence. So we're still continuing on with the side note where we finished up from the actual writing of the Declaration was the 27 grievances. So here's some more note from that by the uh, translator, Richard Beeman, I think. Yeah, Richard Beeman. <clears throat> A significant number of the grievances, nine in all, deal with encroachments on the rights of the provincial legislatures of the colonies. The king is blamed for refusing to approve laws passed by those legislatures. Number one, for instructing his governors to prevent laws already passed from going into effect. Number two, for not allowing laws to go into effect unless the people give up their right to representation in the legislature. Number three, for calling the legislatures into session at times and in places that make it difficult for them to do their business. Number four, for forcing colonial legislatures to adjourn and then preventing them from doing their business against their wishes. Number five, for refusing to call for new elections of representatives, making it impossible for new sessions of the legislatures to begin their business and leaving the colonies without functioning governments. Number six, for refusing to agree to laws establishing provincial courts, thus threatening the colonists' control over their own judicial powers. Number eight, for revoking the charters of government under which the colonies operate and in the process abolishing their laws, number 21, and finally for suspending and in effect abolishing some of the colonies' legislatures, thereby depriving the colonies of the right to govern themselves, number 22. It is not at all surprising that the Declaration of Independence would devote so much space in its list of specific grievances to encroachments on the provincial legislatures, Nearly all the members of the Continental Congress who signed the Declaration were members of those legislatures. They had taken pride in the independence and autonomy of their legislatures. They considered them to be American versions of the House of Commons. But as the conflict with England escalated, royal governors and the other agents of the king not only threatened the independence and autonomy of the colonial legislatures, but also the prestige and power of the provincial legislatures themselves. The Americans viewed these encroachments on their legislatures, therefore not merely as constitutional threats, but also as intensely personal assaults on their prestige and dignity. Several of the grievances deal with the imperial government's interference with American judicial processes, making colonial judges dependent on the British government for their continuation in office and their salaries. Number nine, depriving the colonists of the right of trial by jury. Number 18, attempting to transport some colonists accused of crimes back to Great Britain to be tried there rather than in colonial courts. Number 19, and protecting British troops by mock trial for punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states. Number 15, <coughs> this last grievance this last grievance, which most likely refers to the trial of the British soldiers involved in the Boston Massacre, in 1770 was not wholly fair. Although the British soldiers accused of killing five Bostonians in a scuffle were acquitted, they did receive a fair trial. Indeed, the American patriot leader John Adams stepped forward to defend them. wonder why. If the American grievances began with taxation and gradually extended to perceived threats, the colonial legislative and judicial processes still other grievances came to the fore in the years immediately preceding independence it was these grievances that provided much of the emotional dynamic in the american opposition to british rule when in response to the boston tea party parliament passed the package of acts that came to be known as the coercive acts americans faced new and increasingly ominous threats to their liberties the massachusetts government act had the practical effect of replacing Massachusetts' royal government and charter with a military government headed by General Thomas Gage. Actions reported in the 12th and 21st grievances which accused the king of rendering the military superior to civilian power and of altering fundamentally the forms of our governments. The 16th grievance, which complains of British edicts that cut off American trade with all parts of the world, was a response to the Boston Port Act which closed Boston's port to all trade until the town citizens paid for the tea they had thrown into the harbor. The 20th grievance amounts to a broad-brushed and somewhat unfair attack on the Quebec Act. The intention of that act was to take the first steps in organizing the vast territories in Canada that England had acquired after its victory over France in the Seven Years' War. The act made no provision for representative assemblies in that territory, a step the Americans interpreted or perhaps misrepresented as a prelude to an attack on all representative government. 
and the 13 mainland English colonies. <clears throat> the final five grievances on the list build to a crescendo of outrage over British actions occurring after the outbreak of actual warfare in April of 1775. The 23rd grievance acknowledges the reality of the state of war, but places blame for that state entirely on the king. The 24th grievance with its charge to the king has plundered our seas, ravaged our coast, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. May have been technically true, for that is the nature of warfare. But it was certainly a one-sided depiction of the growing military conflict between the two sides. The 25th grievance, which condemns the king for sending foreign mercenaries, German German. Hegian soldiers to help the British army fight its war to subdue the colonies escalates the war of words still further with its charge that the whole aim of those foreign troops was to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny, all carried out in a manner that was scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages. In December 1775, after reading and rejecting the so-called Olive Branch Petition from the Continental Congress, King George III declared the colonies in a state of rebellion, and, and in support of that declaration, Parliament passed the Prohibitory Act effectively declaring war on American commerce on the high seas and making any sailor on an American merchant ship liable to seizure and sub subsequent impressment into service in the British Navy. The 26th grievance with its lament that the victimized Americans were being forced to become the executioners of their friends and brethren or to fall themselves by their own hands once again lays the blame not at the doorstep of Parliament but at that of the King. The final grievance in the declaration list, the 27th, is extraordinary in several ways. The immediate source of the grievance was the proclamation of Virginia's royal governor, Lord Dunmore, who promised freedom to any of Virginia's slaves who deserted their masters to fight on the side of the British. There was considerable irony as well as tragedy. Oh, this is, let me read that again. The immediate source of the grievance was the proclamation of Virginia's royal governor, Lord Dunmore. So he promised slaves that they would fight for British to be free. Who promised freedom to any of Virginia's slaves who deserted their masters to fight on the side of the British. There was considerable irony as well as tragedy in the fact that it was Lord Dunmore's offer of freedom to slaves who joined the British cause that convinced Virginia's slave-owning clash that the British were intent on robbing them of their liberties. Indeed intent on enslaving them. Nor was it the inciting of domestic insurrections alone that alarmed Americans. That final grievance goes on to, den to denounce the king for inciting the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions to make war against white English colonists. While the king and parliament were hardly blameless in the matter of inciting Indian violence on the American frontier, <clears throat> The American colonists themselves, by their relentless move westward onto Indian lands, did most of the inciting. And the description of the known rule of warfare of the merciless Indian savages is the most shockingly ethnocentric piece of language to appear in any of the American founding documents. Thomas Jefferson, when he penned those words, may have thought that they would strengthen his fellow colonists' commitment to band together to fight the English foe, but the words would bring no credit upon the author. Yeah, nobody wanted to be affiliated with it, especially years later, especially today. In his initial draft of the Declaration, Jefferson included one other item in the Bill of Indictment against the King. As extraordinary both in its length relative to the other specific grievances in the Declaration and in the passion with which it is articulated. It read, so we're going to read it right now. Jefferson included one other item in the Bill of Indictment against the King. So here it is. This is Jefferson's words. <clears throat> so they say he, King George, is talking about the king. He has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere, or to incur miserable death in their transportation thither. This piratical warfare, the opprobrium of infidel powers, is the warfare of the Christian king of Great Britain. Determined to keep open a market in which men should be bought and sold, he has prostituted his negative for suppressing every legislative attempt to prohibit or restrain this execrable commerce, and that this assemblage of horrors might want no fact of distinguished die. He is now exciting those very people to rise in arms among us and to purchase that liberty of which he has deprived them by murdering the people among whom he 
also obtruded them. Thus paying off former crimes committed against the liberties of one people with crimes which he urges them to commit against the lives of another. <clears throat> so here is a, a, a little note or clarification by the, uh, the editor, Richard Beeman. Clearly, the American colonists were not innocent and unwilling victims of British attempts to impose the institution of slavery upon them. And of course, Jefferson's own history as a slaveholder, he owned at least 100 and perhaps as many as 200 slaves at the time he wrote those lines, raises doubts about the consistency, if not the sincerity, of his indictment of British complicity in the slave trade. As things turn out, Jefferson's statement of principle, if that is what it was, did not survive the drafting committee's review. As Jefferson recalled, his condemnation of the slave trade was struck out in complacence to South Carolina and Georgia, who had never attempted to restrain the who had never attempted to restrain the importation of slaves and who, on the contrary, still wished to continue it. <clears throat> um, Jefferson continues, In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people, nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity. We have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and consanguinim. Agun, ag, consanguity we must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind enemies in war in peace friends <coughs> <coughs> they too have been deaf to the voice of justice and consanguinity consanguinity like being sanguine is being like peaceful. So con, like con. We must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. So there is a note. <clears throat> Having presented its bill of indictment, the declaration reminds its intended audience that the colonists had done everything possible to seek a peaceful resolution of their grievances only to be rebuffed by further encroachments on their liberty. And once again, taking aim at George III, it notes that a ruler who is so deaf to the legitimate pleas of his people is nothing other than a tyrant unfit to be the ruler of a free people, nor was it the king alone who had turned a deaf ear to the colonists' pleas. The Americans had warned their British brethren of the injustices committed upon them, but the British people as well seemed deaf to the voice of justice and consang consanguinity. Reluctantly, the Americans were forced to the conclusion that we must hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war and peace friends. This severance of the kinship between the British subjects of the king and the people of America represented yet another step toward an irrevocable separation between mother country and colonies. <clears throat> Continued Jefferson. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress assembled appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connections between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved and that as free and independent states they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. That's powerful right here. <clears throat> All political connections between them and the state of Great Britain is ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may right of do, or may of right do, and for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
<clears throat> and here we got all the people who signed it, and I'll read it. From Georgia, Button Gwinnett, Lyman Hall, George Walton, North Carolina, William Hooper, Joseph Hughes, John Penn, South Carolina, Edward Rutledge, Thomas Hayward Jr., Thomas Lynch Jr., Arthur Middleton. From Massachusetts, John Hancock. From Maryland, Samuel Chase, William Paca, Thomas Stone, Charles Carroll of Carrollton. From Virginia, George Wythe, Richard Henry Lee, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Harrison, Thomas Nelson Jr., Francis Lightfoot Lee, Carter Braxton. Pennsylvania, Robert Morris, Benjamin Rush, Benjamin Franklin, John Morton, George Clymer, James Smith, George Taylor, James Wilson, George Ross. From Delaware, Caesar Rodney, George Reed, Thomas McKean. From New York, William Floyd, Philip Livingston, Francis Lewis, Lewis Morris. From New Jersey, Richard Stockton, John Witherspoon, Francis Hop Hopkinson, John Hart, Abra Abraham Clark. From New Hampshire, Josiah Bartlett, William Whipple. From Massachusetts, Samuel Adams, John Adams, Robert Treat Payne, Albridge Gary. From Rhode Island, Stephen Hopkins, William Allery. From Connecticut, Roger Sherman, Samuel Huntington, William Williams, Oliver Wolcott. From New Hampshire, Matthew Thornton. <clears throat> so here's the, the end note. As the declaration reaches its conclusion, it asserts for the first time that the contemplated action is one taken by the representatives of the United States of America. And then comes the operative sentence of the Declaration of Independence, that these united colonies and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they no longer have any allegiance or obligation to the British crown or the British nation. Implicit in the final two sentences of the document is a promise whose means of fulfillment was at that moment very much unknown. The United Colonies were not only declaring their independence, but stating their intention as independent and united states to carry out a war against one of the world's most formidable military powers, to negotiate a successful peace, to make alliances with other nations, to promote commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. The Americans intended not only to form independent states, but also to find ways in which those independent states can unite in common cause. And to fulfill their commitment to that common cause, the Americans, in the final line of the direct, in the final lines of the Declaration of Independence, pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Interesting. Sorry, guys. A little sick. So next, we're going to continue on with the Constitution of the United States. Peace, y'all.